I was a cop. And my wife was raped. I got the guy who did it, and I killed him. Two months later, I died. I went to hell. 113 of the most vile creatures escaped. They think they'll beat the devil. Nobody beats me. So how am I supposed to send them back? The eyes. Windows to the soul. Destroy the eyes and the damned get a one-way ticket back home to hell. But it's not hell you should be scared of. It's losing your second chance of life on Earth. It's time to give the devil its due. Welcome back, everybody. Once again to the Sons and Shadows cast. We're back for another round of the Lost, Forgotten, and Canceled Television shows. Hey, we should not forget these incredible shows, and we're celebrating. It's our anniversary with this episode. I am your host, as always, Detective Jeff Johnson. And I am the better devil you know, Kevin Smith. And I am the 113th damn soul, Will. All right. Thanks for joining us, Will. We also have two special guests as we jump into Hell on Earth. We have the incredible writing and producer duo known for such projects as Showtime Sleeper Cell, History Channel's Nightfall, Ridley Scott's Robin Hood, and let us not forget Kung Fu Panda. That's right. We have the creators, writers, executive producers of the television show Brimstone with Ethan Reef and Cyrus Voris. Thank you both for joining us. And how are you doing tonight? Good. Hey, Thanks for having good. us. Thanks. Thank you for joining us. And we're going to go ahead. We're going to get right into it. Brimstone first aired October 23rd, 1998. What are your memories of this show from its conception to its debut? Wow, that's a that's a big question. Just sticking with the facts to start with, it Brimstone began its uh, life or its existence just as an idea, as a concept, as an idea we had for a feature film, for a, a horror movie. And we'd written, we were writing some horror movies and we loved the horror genre. And we came up with the idea and then we got busy doing other stuff. And then we had an agent at a agency and the guy who was in charge of the television side of the agency knew about our movie writing. And he came and talked to us and said, like, you guys should get into TV because you're pretty responsible. You work fast. You're talented. And, uh, you deliver on time, and that's what they really care about on TV because they have to make their schedule. Um, Sai, you want to continue? or Yeah, I... so so because we worked primarily in features. Ironically, uh, the first movie that we had written and got produced was uh, the first Tales from the Crypt movie, Demon Knight, that has a lot of sort of crossover thematically with Brimstone. And so, uh, but he, this guy told us we should do television. So the first idea we came up with, ironically, was more of an action show and we okay. pitched it around town and people were like, well, that's interesting. But you know, uh, Sc I think scream had come out pretty recently. And so well, the, the thing is every place we went, but every place we went, they would give the TV executive because we were totally unknown. We were known in the movie world, but we were unknown in the TV world. And they would give them a list of our credits from the movie world. And so go ahead, Sai, you can, well, because up. we had done demon night, he, and Scream had come out that was a big, was a very huge movie at the time and sort of brought the horror genre back. Everyone said, well, this action show is interesting, but, you know, you guys, you wrote this Tales from the Crypt movie, you guys should do horror. You know, we really want to do a horror show. And at first we sort of like, yeah, yeah, whatever. And after you, you know, if enough people tell you you're drunk, you're probably drunk. <laughs> so after like going to like six or seven pitches and hearing the same thing over and over, we sort of came back. We said, well, okay. People are telling us we, we couldn't sell this action show, but everybody wants us to do a horror show. So maybe we should come up with something. And I think that's when Ethan brought up, hey, we had this movie idea. And the movie idea was basically the same premise of the show, except it was a, a guy from hell being brought back to Earth to hunt down like one evil. One escaped soul, damn soul. One escaped yeah. soul. I went, well, okay, television, you have to do a lot of episodes. So why don't we just take this idea and make it, He's hunting down multiple damn souls. And that sort of became uh, the concept for Brimstone. Now, the one anecdote anecdote that's sort of funny that actually this dovetails, which, which we actually use later on in the series, and we actually reference this in the series, 
I remember we pitched to NBC. Well, wait, oh. Scott, size jumping ahead. What happened was we, we actually sort of sold the, the pitch to Warner Brothers, right. but because we had no no success in television, we had success in the movie side, but we weren't like superstar writers, but we were like respected professionals. So we we made this deal with Warner Brothers. It was what was called what's called still in Hollywood an if come deal, meaning you negotiate and you work out a contract, but and you sign it, but it only goes into effect if the two of you together, in this case, me and Sion on one hand and Warner Brothers TV studio on the other hand, manage to sell it to a buyer who's actually going to like pay. Right? right. So Warner Brothers bought into the idea, really liked it, and they teamed up with us and we went out with them as our studio to try and sell it to a network. Right. And one of the first places we went was NBC. And NBC loved the idea, but they said, we have one note. Instead of working for the devil, Zeke Stone should be working for God. And God should be hunting <laughs> down these damn souls. And we were sort of like, really? You think God needs a cop from hell to re like re is well that he wouldn't have been from hell he was going to be from purgatory was he from purgatory right that was the concept and that was their note now the reality <laughs> is at that point in our careers if that was the only we, we didn't tell him we hated it in the room we no. just said oh that's interesting we thought it was this dumb idea but we were like okay well if they're gonna buy it i guess we'll have to change it it won't be as good or it won't be as subversive but okay and then thankfully fox when we pitched it to Fox, Fox loved it. And the thing I remember, uh, Peter Roth, who was the head of Fox at the time, the network, the story he always told was that there was a series that was really popular called Touched by an Angel. Yeah. And it was, a, it was a female angel that would come around every week and help people out. And Peter Roth, for some reason, was walking around one day and said, I want to do Touched by a Devil. Somebody should do Touched by a Devil. <laughs> and then just coincidentally, we walked in with Brimstone the next day, and it was like, oh, perfect. That's the perfect show. So that was sort of the the, but the, the punchline that Sai alluded to is that later, after we, we made the pilot, the pilot got on the air, and we made the series, we got to a point where at one point, and maybe one of you guys who have just rewatched the entire series can tell us what episode it's in, where the desk clerk, played by Lori Petty, starts, you know, like Stone, Stone sort of like opens his heart and reveals the truth of his situation, which is a crazy thing for him to do, but he actually tells her the truth. I think he he wraps it up in like just a story that because she's like. I'm a I'm a storyteller, but Fiery I write or something, right? And so he says, oh, I got yeah. an idea for you. She's How about got writer's this? block? Right, right, right. And, right. She, and he's he trying to help her with story. the writer's block. It's his story. She says, No, no, I'm gonna that's not right. It's gotta be God that sends him out. In fact, oh, it's and then she has this great punch. It's even better. There's a bunch of damn it's the God Squad. Yes. And I was <laughs> literally right. That bit was a literally based on our experience yeah. in NBC. Although I'll like, give the I give gotta give the episodic <laughs> writer who wrote that episode, who I think was Fred Golan credit, because I think he came up with there's a whole bunch of them and we call right, them the God, God Squad. Because <laughs> when we when we pitch that or or came up with that in the writer's room that we were running we just pitched our anecdote from our real Fred, lives like Fred came up with that 11 with, months with earlier or whatever okay. and Fred yeah, but, came up with the God Squad yeah. yeah but it's literally in the series that that's based on like our NBC pitch so so and the, the look the look on Peter Horton's face when she revises his uh, pitch <laughs> is a lot like the look on our faces in the NBC office right with the writer <laughs> Exactly, exactly. When the network is giving you crazy notes. But so that's the origin story uh, of Brimstone. You know, it, it was interesting because, I mean, obviously, we've learned a lot since then. At the time, I remember thinking, wow, TV is easy. You just come up with a really good idea. You pitch it. They pay you to write it, the pilot. And then if it's good, they make the pilot. And then if that's good, they just put your show on the air. So it, I was I was sort of naive at the time about like, oh, all you have to do is write something great. And of course, it gets on the air and it's going to be a huge hit. We had worked <laughs> at that point. We had already worked for at least 10 years in the trenches writing movies, first at a very low budget level, then 
at a more like moderate level. And then finally, when Demonite got made and, and came out in like 1995 at the studio level for a, a couple of years or a few years. And the idea, because over that entire 10 years, we'd had a few low budget movies made, but we'd only had one studio feature film actually get made, even though we had written like, I don't want to say dozens, but a hell of a lot of screenplays, which were good enough that we were getting paid and we were getting, you know, we were building up our street cred in Hollywood, but almost nothing would ever get made. And then we took our first try in television, like Sai says, and we basically hit a home run. Like literally we sold the pilot pitch. We got to make the pilot and then the pilot got on the air. Now the show didn't become a hit. So it wasn't, like we didn't win the World Series, but we still like got into the World Series our first time, you know, out of the gate, which led us to have a false impression of the <laughs> relative percentages of success in movies where we've been working and, you know, busting our behinds for 10 years with very little, even though we'd had some success, but very little of our creative material getting out in front of the audience. And then the first chance we had we 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 got out in front of the audience in TV. We were like, this is awesome, you know. I remember being on the, coming our first night on the, the first day of the shoot on the pilot before the show was even picked up. We were just doing the pilot in uh, Toronto and coming out, it was a night shoot and there it had it snowed the night before. So there was snow on the ground and we came out and there were, and th the thing about TV is that writers get to produce uh, their own material in television. In features, the screenwriter, unless you're a director, you're sort of like the low man on the totem pole. I mean, we wrote Demon Knight, and I think we got to come on the set like one day. But when we did uh, Brimstone Television, you're actually producing your show. You're involved in casting. You're involved in working with the director. You're on the set every day. It's a very different uh, situation. And so I remember us coming to the set the uh, first night of the brimstone shoot for the pilot and there's snow on the ground we're in toronto there's all these trucks there's hundreds of people setting up and i just looked at ethan and i said look what we've wrought look what we've done holy moly we had this crazy idea and now there's like hundreds of people getting paid to like bring our crazy batshit crazy idea to life yeah. it was really it was a pretty amazing experience i remember yeah that was that that was awesome and we had a pretty good experience on the production of the pilot i mean there's some you know interesting stories we can tell about that but one story which for me is as like sai had that what have we wrought moment at the very start like right out of the gate and then we were probably halfway through production and we were shooting an exterior street scene when Zeke Stone goes back home to his old house to try and check in on the life that he left when he died, you know, years ago. Mm. And it, which I don't know if you guys remember that scene from the pilot. We, we love that yeah. scene. We think it's, yeah. it's really cool. Um, yeah, I rewatched the pilot right before we came on. Oh, great. So we were outside and it was just the middle of the day. And I, and I remember these these two kids walked over to us, or to me at least. Cy wasn't that far from me. He might have been right by me. These were like 12-year-old kids, right? No, one of, them, one of them was like a high school kid, like 15, 16, 17. But his little brother was there, and his little brother was like 10. Hmm. And they walked over, and this is a long time ago. And there was already a lot of American production in Toronto but, and Vancouver, but nowhere near as much as there is now. Like it was still kind of an exciting, you know, exotic event for a, a big television show or movie to just show up on your doorstep in Toronto in a residential neighborhood, which is not the case anymore. I think it happens like every day, right? So these two guys, they came over and the younger kid, the 10 year old kid asked like, what are you guys, what are you guys doing? What are you shooting? And I basically pitched him like, the elevator pitch of Brimstone. Yeah. And I said, oh, it's a show about a, a guy who's a cop and his wife gets raped and it's terrible tragedy. And then he dies in the line of duty. And because he did this terrible thing, 
of uh, killing the, the rapist who, who hurt his wife, he's sent to hell. And then, thir- you know, years later, whatever, I don't remember, 13 years later, what was it? 15. 15 years later, 113 damn souls break out of hell, and the devil makes a deal. And if he can go and track them all down and send them back to hell, he'll give them a second chance. And the kid, the, the 10-year-old younger brother, looked at me like, a gog to use an <laughs> obscure word and said that's awesome <laughs> and i thought to myself we might have a chance of actually getting on tv and this 10 year old kid in toronto yeah. loves it yeah so yeah we did the pilot and then you know we did uh we had a great director did a great job felix alcala not only directed the pilot but also was the dp he actually shot the pilot also which was okay. very cool yeah a lot of the a lot of the look that um, damn soul number one thirteen was uh, <laughs> mentioning um, came came from Felix actually. Yeah, Felix did oh. a great job, and so yeah, because again, he not just was a, he he came up as a cameraman, so uh, he not only directed the pilot, but he also also shot it. And so- also, one other specific detail that I will give Felix tremendous credit for is that remember. Sai and I had never created a TV show before. We'd written movies. We'd actually been on sets in New York because, like, we went to NYU Film School, both of us, and we were both involved in a lot of production stuff. But professionally, we had just written some movies, right? And the first day when we met with Felix as a prospective, pr- the pr- prospective director for our pilot, he, we, we were talking to him, just having our first general conversation, and he talked to us about how he was a very visual guy, and he shot a lot of his own material, and he'd come up in the camera department, which was really cool to us. And he said, I've got this idea. I think the show, it should, it should look like, uh, it should just be really garish neon colors. Like a comic book. Kind of like a bright <laughs> comic book and neon everywhere or just really bright. And we were like, and that's a little too much light. Like, it's a little too bright. Like, we get the neon thing. If it's more, like, spun towards a film noir thing, because we see it much more dark and shadowy. And I give him tremendous credit, because even though we were, like, much younger than him and had no track record in television, he he heard us, and he said, yeah, that could be cool, too. We can do that. That works. And that's what he... And he, like took that on and embraced it and did like, a, we, I, I think an incredible job with it, you know? So yeah, we were really lucky that, that he was our director. Yeah. And what, and so we did the pilot and then by just some, you know, the TV lottery miracle, we got picked up and we got, you know, we got to do the show. And as Ethan, I said, the show was much harder the, than the pilot. The, you know, the pilot was like, we say a, that? no, the <laughs> pilot is like making a cool little movie. And then you get picked up and suddenly, especially in the days of, and even today on network television, not streaming or cable, you have the schedule is so important. You've got to like put a new show on every Friday night. And and so the sudden grind of like, oh my God, we have to generate, you know, all these other episodes of this show. Um, that was a challenge to say the least, but um, you know, it was a great that was a it, it was just a great experience on one hand to just sort of have that project come to fruition and get in front of the audience. Um, I remember when we finished the pilot and we were pretty significantly involved in post-production. We were both we were both into editing when we were at film students. We both edited a lot of movies for ourselves and for other other colleagues, classmates. And we were really involved in the post-production. And I always remember when we finally delivered the, 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 the final sales version of the pilot, I was so happy even before they put it on the schedule and announced like we won the gold ticket just because it was the first thing in our careers. And again, we had been working in the trenches for a, almost a decade and a half. It was yeah. the first thing where I could give it to somebody to look at and say, me and my partner side made this, or like we're in charge of making this. If you like it, it's exact. It's because it's exactly what we want it to be. If you don't like it, 
it's because it's exactly what we wanted it to be. And you just don't like it. You know, that was such a, it was like such an accomplishment, you know, to feel this is really what we had in our mind's eye when we set out low those, whatever it was at that point, a year or two years before to try and, you know, to try and put out into the world. Well, it definitely felt like a passion project when I laid eyes on it. And I was into like lots of different things in college, but I, I first read about it in like Starlog and then I saw trailers on Fox because I was watching other shows because they're they're known for canceling just about every show I've ever loved. <laughs> <laughs> I I would never give up on the network until much, much later. But this came around my uh, one of my couple of years in college and I just remember seeing like the trailers. I'm like, this looks freaking cool. It's Tuesday. I get to Tuesday. It's not on Tuesday. And oh then, no! I'm That's and right. then, I, and then it has remember. like a real saying. It's on Friday, and I'm like, oh, right, I guess man. it's my Friday show now with like, you know, Millennium and whatnot. Yeah. And that's how I got onto the show. But it, it's definitely got a beautiful, beautiful look. And right away, I could tell like, this is very much a unique show with a terrific look. And I don't know. It just grabbed me from the word go like no other show has like really grabbed me i attribute brimstone to being the first show i fell in love with that i rewatch it almost every year i am always wow. trying to think of ways i can kind of get people talking about it finally have a podcast i can do it so this is brimstone is what got me to be so creative and more involved in like tv shows oh that's awesome even wow, to the boards yeah. i tried to be a moderator i was so involved i even like put up <laughs> ads on bulletin boards at school saying oh man brimstone's being canceled please you know send ads you know go to this website send this email things like that i was all over the place and well if you I if just want to say if thank you're... you the next time you're very welcome and the, the next time you're in the greater los angeles area let us know and lunch will be on us jeff That's right we'll we owe you that much we okay. always say that for brimstone fans we'll buy you lunch come to la and get a free lunch we had dana de, de lorenzo from or de lorenzo she's gonna yell at me for saying her name wrong again sorry dana <laughs> uh, she, she was on and she told us like if we come to la she's or she's got to come to Phoenix and then she's going to buy us a beer. So there you okay. go. Fun we'll do that too. That's a good deal. Also, if we come to Phoenix, we'll buy you guys beers. <laughs> cool. Good deal. Yeah. Jeff and I are both in Phoenix. Okay, okay. cool. Awesome. They stuck cool. me up in smoky old Oregon. Or oh. that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's, <laughs> there's due north of us. Yeah. When there's no forest fires, it's great. Ah, oh, that's great. That's Otherwise, cool. you're just kind of oh, choking up. <laughs> so, like Jeff, like we've been talking about, Brimstone has a very unique look to it. And you guys are responsible for that look, it sounds like, along with Felix. What were you trying to capture with that look? Well, I think it's not so much... I think the thing that the story Ethan told, I think the show had... Like you said, I'm a comic book fan, and the show had a sort of a comic book element. But I think what we recognize is we were trying to sort of do, it's not that unique now, but I think at the time it was, we were trying to do this mashup of a sort of a, of a cop show and a supernatural show. And we thought the more sort of gritty and real it looked, uh, the more you could buy the supernatural elements. And I think, and Felix brought a real visual flair to it. It's interesting, the pilot is shot on 35 millimeter film, and then the series, mostly because Warner Brothers was trying to save money, was shot on Super 16. And mm -hmm. But in a way, and we talked to Felix about this, I think at first Ethan and I were freaking out, like, oh, it's going to look cheap. And Felix said, no, no, I can make this work. We can make this work for the show because of the sort of, I think, the blue tint and the sort of desaturated... I think it's one of the first things, especially if you think of it at the time, so much American television at that point was so sort of overlit and very color saturated. So the idea that you're doing this show that's the opposite, that's desaturated and all sort of blue, it was pretty radical at the time. And I, again, I think the only reason we got away with it is because the show was sort of under the radar in a little bit, in, in a little bit of a way. So... So, yeah, so the show was actually shot on Super 16. And in a way, I, I think that, you know, that sort of helped keep that sort of 
gritty sort of look to it as it moved forward. Yeah, we our thing was we wanted it to be dark and we didn't want it to be so stylized that the connection to reality or some aspect of like the streets and the crime, even though most of the crime in the show was being committed by bad guys and women who escaped from hell, it was still real crime with real uh, human victims. And we just didn't want it to be so stylized that it sort of, you know, impacted the connection the audience would feel to the, to the reality of what was going on, you know? Um, and I think, I think fe mostly Felix and the art department, you know, managed to sort of like balance, balance uh, on that, on that mashup of the horror and the, more naturalistic police drama, police drama really yeah. well well i like how they actually portrayed you you actually took zeke stone and actually made him a detective in the show instead of just like a typical procedural he actually did the detective work he didn't have other people doing the work for him other than the little tips he'd get from the, from the devil which sometimes were subtle sometimes not so subtle <laughs> right yeah. right we should mention john glover as the devil who was uh Really yeah, the, terrific, terrific. The, in the thing show. is, in the beginning, when John Glover was cast in the pilot, he was only cast in the pilot. Oh. Like we didn't. It wasn't part of the plan that the devil was going to come back and and be like a regular re recurring character. Maybe recurring, but not a regular. And there were a few dynamics at play. One of them was that Glover was just like brilliant, like at playing the devil. I mean, we knew he was a great actor and we were sure he was going to do a really good job, but he was amazing. Do you and the remember other one was Ethan that his chemistry with, with Peter Horton with Peter Horton was just like off the charts, right? Now, and wait, then, Ethan, do you remember there was a brief moment? Yeah. Where Fox no, I, I, I was going to keep going on the positive stuff. and then No, no, I was just going to say, where Fox wanted us to recap. Recast, yeah. Don Glover as the devil. Yeah, no. which was the theme. And we, I know. We, we fought so hard not, in fact, you guys may know, or at least Jeff may know this as like the true super fan. There is an alternate version of the, uh, the first devil scene. The first big scene from the pilot with Stone and the Devil. There's the original version that we shot in Toronto. And the version that's actually in the pilot is a reshoot that we shot on the back lot at Warner Brothers. After we had managed to convince Fox to let us keep uh, John Glover. And it may have been a thing where they said, you can try to reshoot it. I don't remember if they like exceeded or like gave up their demand that, that we replace him before or after we had reached. I think it was after, I think we had to reshoot it and submit the new scene. And then they would like sign off and say, okay, this is cool. Um, which was, it's great the way it is. Personally, I preferred the original version that we shot in Toronto where John Glover was art directed a little more like, a little more out of time, like he yeah. could have walked in off the set of The Devil and Daniel Webster, as opposed to just in a suit and an overcoat, you know, like he walked in off Wall Street as a corporate raider guy or whatever. But that's like a, it was okay. It was a small loss to suffer in exchange for keeping John Glover in the show. And after we reshot the scene, Fox said, yes, okay, we'll, we can, we can accept this. Well, then the other thing, and, and this is, I don't, it's not really positive or negative. It's just, it's sort of the thing that happened. So, so in the pilot, we had really originally written a Peter Horton's character, Zeke Stone, with uh, a little sort of dark, sardonic, sardonic humor. He had, you know, he has that line in the pilot where this, the woman, he's doing some research. The librarian. The, guy, the librarian sort of hits on him. And he says, oh, I'm sorry, I'm married. And she walks away and says, not to mention dead. You yeah. know, there was that element that everybody really responded to. And what happens in television, certainly, I think it still happens to this day, you make the pilot and then <clears throat> you ship it off to the network and everybody's waiting around to see if the show's going to be picked up. And then you don't actually start filming again for several months. 
Because then, like, if the show gets picked up, you have to start writing new scripts for new episodes, getting production ready and everything. So there's this several-month lag time uh, between the pilot and, let's say, episode two. So when we came back to do episode two, Peter, who was great in the pilot and, and you know, was great in the show, Peter had somehow... I don't... I've never to this day figured out why or why this was, but he somehow... He got self-conscious about the dark humor, about the comp. Like he, I guess he thought it was too broad or it was on the edge, and he just didn't want to play it anymore. He sort of stopped. He didn't want to play those dark, sardonic beats. And so the problem was, and Ethan talked about the show was always dark, but we always felt like, well, as long as there's a little bit of humor, dark humor in it, we can get away with doing these really grim stories and dark yeah. things. But after the pilot, like Peter came back like four. Yeah, he also later. got he also he also got a very different haircut, so he looked like Steve McQueen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah there's brief moments before his hair is right. You'll see the hair go all over the place. Yes. So for whatever reason, he came back, and you know he's still great in the part, but he 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 wasn't playing that dark humor anymore, and so. Ethan and I were scrambling as so we were Peter. still writing. We were still writing that as part of the voice of the character. Oh. But it wasn't Peter. That was part of the way. formula that had made the pilot right. work. And we assumed but, would make the series work. But Peter was not into it anymore. And, you know, you discover when you when you have a show that's basically a single lead show, it's really a creative collaboration between the writers and creators and the star of the show. I think if you have an ensemble series, it's a little bit more like, it, it's a little more of a like freewheeling thing, but when you have a a, a show based, no, it's on less art, of a freewheeling thing. What you mean to say is it's right. more of do what's written in the script, <laughs> or we can Ethan, fuck Ethan. you out of the ensemble and replace you <laughs> and with the you next off. ensemble. Right. Ethan's being the sort of like dictatorial show creator. No, I, but, well, but so so the thing is, so we were sort of scrambling because we felt that dark humor was a huge element of the show, yeah. and then at some point we were like, well. Glover was so great and had such a great chemistry with Peter. Let's bring the devil in as a series regular and we'll use him to, because the other thing is that P when Peter and Glover were in a scene together, Peter would automatically sort of, Peter Horton would sort of lighten up a little bit because he was with John. He really loved working with John. They had great chemistry. And so in a weird sideways way, it was sort of like, okay, you know, Zeke Stone is no longer the voice of the dark humor. The devil is the voice of the dark humor. And yet he will work Zeke Stone into his sort of world of dark humor. And that became, and again, it's nothing we planned for. But now when you watch the show, it's like you can't even imagine the show without John Glover is this, is showing up in every episode and doing his bits and everything. And uh, so, so, you know, you... you it's interesting how this stuff sort of organically happens in weird ways that you wouldn't predict when you're collaborating on, on doing a TV show or a movie. So that's sort of the origin of John as the devil becoming like such a huge part of the show. And actually, and also, well, and also that's the entire origin of Lori Petty as Max, because that's a character we literally created out of whole cloth in a desperate attempt to keep more humor, more dark humor in the show to balance out and somewhat leaven how dark it was. Because like Cy was just discussing, Peter had his, he had made a conscious creative decision as an actor. And he was also, I think he was also an executive yeah, producer, producer on the show, show yeah. that he wasn't going, he, his vision of Zeke Stone did not include that sardonic sense of humor. And we, you know, we tried, we made, we made our effort or we gave it to college try to talk to him about that and, and convince him that that would not hurt the character would only help it. But we lost that discussion or that argument. And then we felt like it was our responsibility. We had to find some way, you know, and like Cy was saying, John Glover was a big part of that. And then we just decided to create another character who could could help us on the, on the scene. And, and we lucked out because both Glover and Lori Petty had great chemistry with Peter Horton. I mean, they were they were really great together. And so then it became like, well, it was it was a joy to write those scenes and to see them play them because they were they were just always they were always really good together. And we don't 
we don't have to say anything else, good, bad, or indifferent about our relationship throughout the season with Peter Horton, except for this one thing, which I'll say, which is you guys may remember, again, having just binge watched the season, there's a scene towards the end of the season where Stone is alone in an elevator. And all of a sudden, a thousand snakes fall <laughs> onto his head no. and surround him. And all I will say to you is, when we got to that scene, Cy and I were very happy that we had <laughs> written, and written that scene so that Peter could enjoy acting with all those snakes <laughs> and surrounding him. That's and the writer's great drama. The, the writer's revenge. I will I'll actually elaborate in this way because I think it's a positive thing. We had um, we had a lot of creative differences with our star on Brimstone with Peter Horton. I think Peter he he had he had been known mostly he had become a TV star on the show Thirty Something, which was yes. a, a big show in the the I guess late eighties, yeah. early nineties, and so. Peter's concerns as an actor, as a producer, were all about character. We used to joke that uh, Peter's version of the show would be dead something. It would just be about a dead guy who's back after 15 years hanging out on Earth. And what does he do? And I think Ethan and I came more from a hardcore genre and horror background. And so, you know, we were more. No, we didn't come from a hardcore. No, 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 no. I'm talking about what we were. No. I'm talking about what we were interested in in terms of the show. Yeah. We would have pushed, uh, I think our ideal conception of the show would have pushed the the horror elements and the mythology elements a little bit more. And Peter really didn't care about any of that. He was just about... Yeah, our conception of a show about a dead cop back from hell to capture 113 damn souls <laughs> for the devil. Yeah. No, no. But my point is Peter's was like, yeah, yeah, I don't care about that. I want to talk about this character and what he's going through after being 15 years damned and now he's back and everything. And there was a lot of creative tension back and forth. But, but this, I, is, this is the thing. My my issue with when Cy goes on this like poetic, nostalgic, 50-50 version of events <laughs> is that we're not hacks and we're not genre maniacs. We knew, we'd argued in favor of visually of retaining the naturalistic straight dramatic human elements of the universe we didn't want it to just be blood splattered horror no of course not i'm not out. saying that we i'm not saying that i'm not a saying balanced that even... mixture of those two elements okay i'm not saying that i'm saying that our druthers what we enjoy as filmmakers and as storytellers is more into genre elements than Pete. Peter really didn't have any interest in that. He was he was interested in this this character and the fascinating part. Yeah, of the, the existential angst of right, a man exactly. back from the dead, out of but, time, out of place, right. reconnecting so with his environment. You know. So the point is that there was a lot of creative tension while we were doing the series. But I think the punchline is, when I look back on it years later, that creative tension created a much more original and idiosyncratic show because it really, it does live sort of half in this world of examining this guy's existential dilemma and also in this world of genre and, you know, the, the, the Carthaginian warrior back from hell and the, you know, Asher, but doctor, there's a lot of mythology and a lot of cool horror elements in the show. And yet it also, it it plays very naturalistically with his character and all the challenges he faces being back and pining over his dead wife. And I do think, you know, because that was, uh, because that was Peter's main concern, it, it, those elements really dovetailed nicely. And again, we had a really rocky creative relationship with him, but at the end of the day, I think the show benefited from it. I would say... Maybe you could, you know, you could make an argument like, well, maybe the show wasn't commercially successful because it wasn't, it was a little bit of a mashup and a little bit of like, it's a little bit of this and a little bit of that. But I think ultimately that's why people still are into the show now, 20 years later, and, and why the show holds up 
because it does it is very idiosyncratic and very um, yeah. unique I, in a way. I just think it's a false dichotomy. I think it's rewriting history. I think we always wanted the existential angst element. We we're the ones who created that character. We're the ones who wrote the pilot which had those moments before we ever met Peter Horton or had him cast. And if you really right. remember, it was a struggle every day to keep as much of the genre elements, which are in the idiosyncratic version of the show that actually exists in there in the, the face best, of. Look, you know, I'll say this, the, 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 uh, the best anecdote uh, at some point later in the season uh, oh, yeah. towards the back end of the season, we were trying to uh, bring on a new uh, a new writer producer onto the show to help us out with the workload, and we found this guy that Ethan and I met. We really liked and thought he was really talented. And uh, Peter Horton, and he had he had impressive credits. And Peter Horton met him and talked to him and everything. And then we had a meeting with Peter, and we said, "So Peter, what do you think of this guy?" And Ethan, tell him what Peter said. Peter said, yeah, Peter had gone to lunch with him. And the, we had told the guy, like, you got to charm him, you know, because he's got to he's got to buy in. And then after he came back from lunch to the office to see us and we said, so what do you think, Peter? What do you think of that guy? And Peter goes, I don't know, guys. He seems like the B version of you guys. <laughs> <laughs> and it was hilarious because. That was the closest to a compliment he ever came to us. It was like, okay, <laughs> if this dude is the B version of us, that means we're the A version of something. So <laughs> yeah, we got the know, A team here. <laughs> that's good. You know. Exactly. Exactly. But of course, we couldn't hire the guy. So it was just it was interesting. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I, I don't think it's rewriting history because I again, for me, I look back on it and I watch the show now and I feel like, oh, okay, there's a lot of there's a lot of us in there. There's a lot of Peter in there. And I think that, again, that fusion makes the show probably more unique than it would have been if one version or the other, if Ethan and I had won all the battles or quite. Yes, I hate to tell you, Cy, but the Peter version could only have gotten on like like the independent feature channel. In the year 2000. <laughs> well, I don't know what you Dream. No, that's probably true. No, that's what I'm saying. That's my point is that the, the friction makes it actually, you know, a really interesting thing. So do you think if your guys' original version had made it on the air more so that it might have been more successful commercially? I think so, but I don't know that it would have been better. I think it just would have been more commercial. I mean, that's a hard call. You know, the thing right. is, if you look at a show like Buffy, Buffy's a pretty hardcore genre show. Buffy's a great show. All the sort of, uh, but all the sort of, um, I would say all the, uh, the the sort of character work and the idiosyncratic elements of Buffy are sort of subtext. It's like, oh, high school is like horror and fighting demons and vampires. It's all subtext. This show is pretty balls out genre, genre stuff and very escapist. I think... Uh, so, you know, uh, who knows, but I don't, at the end of the day, it, you know, it's a, it's, there's maybe an alternate universe, but I, again, I, mean, I sincerely, I sincerely believe that the best version of Brimstone exists in those 13 episodes. Really? I Honestly, really and I'm the guy, obviously evidenced by the last 10 minutes or whatever, who doesn't necessarily align with size take on, oh, it's great. The combination pushed us to, you know, stretch further or whatever. But honestly, in terms of its commercial success, it fell prey to other dynamics, including a change of a change of regime at Fox oh, and, yeah. and other issues, sort of in-house issues between the executives at Fox and other elements that, whether it had been the original conception that we had of the show or the version, you know, that we created together with, uh, with, with Peter Horton that Cy is talking about, I don't know that it would have had that much of an effect on the result. If it had come out of the gate and been like the next X-Files and, you know, we had huge audiences every, every time we were on the air, then obviously that would have, that would have changed. They wouldn't have been able to cancel the show then. But <laughs> right. I don't know. I don't know if those incremental changes, you know, to the tone or the content 
would have would have done that. I don't know. So you we said know. incremental. Like, is it if you guys had had your druthers more so? Do you think it would have made a noticeable? How noticeable a change do you think it would have had? Yeah, in- I think that you'll get a different answer from me inside because I don't think it would have had that noticeable a change, except the hero slash anti-hero would have been the source of more of the dark humor. So like we would have never, we might never have created uh Max, which would have been the tragedy in the aftermath because she's a great character, yeah. right? But that's but what Cy, I mean. Cy might answer that, oh, it would be noticeable because there would be more, you know, no, genre I, hijinks and less existential human drama or something. Well, Ethan, I could go back and forth on this. I think again, I think the version of the show that exists is the best possible version of Brimstone, quite frankly. I, I don't think we left anything off the field, you know, when we did it, it was just an interesting dynamic uh, working with Peter. And again, I think, and I and I know anecdotally that Peter is always surprised. A lot of people come up to him and mention Brimstone, and he's always like, "Oh yeah, thanks, interesting." He's like, "What?" Like, yeah, yeah, no, because he's actually I think surprised by how many people love that show. Mm. Because again, it, the the process of making it, and you hear the story. I mean, look, Jaws the biggest hit movie of all time, still regarded as one of the greatest films of all time, making that movie was a nightmare. And Richard Dreyfus and, you know, Robert Shaw hated each other and the shark didn't work, everything. But you sometimes that's the way you make something that's really uh, profound and long-lasting and, and something that really sticks with people. So I think in the case of Brimstone, I do believe that's why it, it's such, it is such a cult show and people's, you know, respond to it to this day because of a lot of those dynamics that are sort of ephemeral you know yeah my in my opinion on a couple of those topics i think part of the the main problem for the commercial success is the second they moved it from tuesday to friday um unless you were pairing it literally up with x files that was not gonna work it needed to be paired up with x files but x files had already moved or had it not moved i don't remember but that's part of the problem with that because then you got stuck on fridays but yeah, also to to Ethan's point, there there are some deleted scenes out there. I know because I have a couple posted on a YouTube channel, <laughs> and um, one of them is "It's a Hell of a Life." How you originally intended to end it with the devil oh, and pulling man. the handkerchiefs out of his pocket and be like, "Oh, oops!" And I would argue that that actually should have been with the end of that episode because it w- wow. it fit everything before that. And after that, so that not being there, if you never knew it was out there, that's fine. But the second you know that that should have been there, and you see how it plays out, it it completely fits the tone of the show, and it feels like something got missing. That's funny. That's interesting. Yeah, that was. Man, that's a really good. You're a genius, Jeff. Well, look, that, I'll tell you about that episode. That was a hard episode to get approved, and I actually give Peter Horton credit because. He loved that episode, the whole concept of it so much. Oddly enough, and not to stop no, aside from telling the story he's going to tell, which he should go back and tell, but I'll just interject. That entire story came out of a conversation we had with him on the phone. while he had, When he had called to complain about some, one of the script, scripts we had written for some other preceding episode, <laughs> and we ended up in this conversation, and I remember saying something to him, saying to, to him something along the lines of, well, that's the question, right? Like, would you have gone to hell if you hadn't, if your wife hadn't been raped and you hadn't killed the guy? Maybe. You, you're not, it's not like you were an angel up until that point, but you weren't a devil either. It's a, you know, it's a debatable thing. And then like, It's a Wonderful Life is one of my favorite movies from all time. And somehow that came up like, oh, you know, the idea of like going back through his own past and revisiting things and what if he had gone this way or that way and Cy and I started talking about it and 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 Peter was like that's awesome that's awesome we should definitely do that episode and then Cy and I were smart as producers and showrunners we found our way into such a quirky oddball episodic story because we called it a bottle show even though you know you guys know what a bottle show is it means an entire episode of TV that exists in one location. So you get to save on the budget because you don't have to move from place to place to place. So even though it had like 
probably a dozen locations, they were all on the back lot at Warner Brothers. And that oh, wasn't man. usually the case with our show. So we we try we managed to sell it to the studio and the network as, yeah, it's a great story and it's original and it's interesting and we can save money because we're just going to go from one set over here to another set over here. But also, but right the, the thing I was saying is that Peter was instrumental in getting that episode approved to go into production because he loved the idea so much and he loved the idea to be able to play Zeke Stone in different periods in his past and different permutations of his personality because the studio and network were very much like, well, this is a great episode, but this is an episode you do in like season five of the show. Like, like the idea was that people weren't familiar enough with the basic conceit and the basic premise and the character and the stories to really change it up that much. You know, they were in the mindset of like, for television to be successful, you know, you establish a, a tone, you establish a premise, you establish a story structure and like, like, look, like CSI or NCS. And you do that every week, like clockwork. And then later on, once the show's a hit, then you can change it up. We'll do the musical episode or we'll do this episode. And so that was their viewpoint. But, and and we, we had another we actually had another big ally on that episode. It, it was it, we could not have managed to convince the powers that be to do it without help from Peter himself. And also we got Felix to direct it. And Felix was such a fast moving, slick, super professional craftsman that they, the powers that be bought in to the idea that Felix would be able to shoot this. And we actually could save money by just going from place to place to place that were all adjacent places on the back lot. Um, and it still look good. Yeah, but so again, and our argument was always, well, there's two schools of thought. One school of thought is like you have the formula and, you know, you get the audience used to the formula. You do something like this and you change it up much later in the run of the show. But my argument and Ethan's argument was always like, yeah, but sometimes you change it up and that's how you hook people. Because they're watching this show and all of a sudden they see this episode that's totally out of the box and they're like, what the fuck is this? I got to watch this show. Mm -hmm. I will never forget a hugely popular show back in the day uh, was ER, which was a Warner Brothers show. And I remember very early on in the run of ER, around five or six episodes in, they did an episode where uh, the hero, uh, 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 Anthony Edwards, was the hero doctor with George Clooney before he was a movie star. And they're trying to save this woman's child from some accident and the, the baby dies and it was like a huge thing like holy shit the heroes fail right our hero doctors and this was early in the run i don't know specifically it was certainly within the first 13 episodes of the show and i remember casually watching that show back in the day and watching that episode and going like holy shit i gotta watch this show every week because they just did something i've never seen before and that was our argument to the studio and the network that we know you, you let us do this crazy out of the box episode because, you know, sometimes that's how you get people hooked into the show. You know, right. you do something totally different that they're not expecting. And I do think, you know, again, for people who are fans of the show, everybody talks about that as being one of their favorite episodes or one of the best episodes. So I think, you know, it certainly worked. And again, as Ethan, I say, shout out to Peter for, really championing it, championing that episode to the network and studio and getting us approval to actually. You know what? I have to say, I've never, I've never thought this before, but because of the creation of that idea, the premise for that episode would never have existed if Horton hadn't called us up to complain about something else in the show. <laughs> and I hadn't ended up getting into that discussion with him about was his character doomed to go to hell from the beginning or was it just that one terrible tragic uh, event that led him to murder someone so i guess i have to say you know there there is an aspect of 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 what sai was talking about where the show wouldn't be what it is well certainly i would never say it could be what it is without peter because he's the hero of the show but <laughs> that 
the show, you know, there would be no It's a Wonderful or It's a Hell of a Life without Peter Horton in the mix. Mm. And I can't imagine Brimstone without It's a Hell of a Life. Now these, whatever it's been, you know, more 24 years later, so 23 mm. years later. So, yeah. It's yeah. one of my absolute favorites uh, next to Repentance, actually. Oh, Repentance. That's a great episode. Yeah, that's awesome. Thanks. Yeah, I like yeah. Ashes a lot. Really yeah, is. Ash is another great episode. Asher Badak, too. Oh, my goodness. And then you don't see her until the very end, and it's like, oh, that's right. She's still hanging around out there somewhere. Yeah, man. You were talking about the show's mythology, and I thought that was a really cool like, evolution of the mythology that we already had going with the demons, but that it was a priestess of a pagan religion who was damned by being judged by the followers of Yahweh yeah after her crime was after the crime in their eyes and so yep. she was sentenced by a different god's laws well that's the thing and there are you know a lot of things you can hem and haw but she was sentenced by the one true god's laws and that's <laughs> yeah. just one of those things you, you got to buy into it and that's like the primal po tent pole foundation of the mythology you know that being said, we went out of our way to not present it as a idiosyncratic or didactic version of that moral universe. If you remember, there's like, I think there's a scene in one of the early episodes with Stone and Father Horn, who's a Catholic priest, where Stone actually says, I don't know, Father everybody's entitled to their opinion because uh, there was nobody there in hell for eating uh, meat on Lent or, you know, some line uh, similar yeah. to that, where it was like, it's not, you know, your, 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 your ultimate universal fate is not tied into the small print of, of your faith. It's, it's tied into primal moral uh, behavior, you know? Yeah, real quick on that. So I noticed when I was rewatching it that they specifically mentioned if he had killed because Jax didn't kill Stone's wife, he wasn't entitled to kill Jax. That's like eye for an eye. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly yeah. that's exactly eye for an eye. Yes. Yeah, there's yeah, there's righteous eye for an eye or righteous execution, and then there's the fact that he took pleasure in the murder. Yeah, was, uh, yeah, yeah. That yeah. was the true sin. Was was yeah. That's a good point. Yeah, lust for it. Yeah, yeah, that was interesting. I remember we did the episode with Gilbert Jacks and his mother, played by the uh, recently departed great Louise Fletcher from uh, yeah. the Cuckoo's Nest. It was amazing that we got her to do that. And yeah. I remember it was interesting. Also, that also episode came about um, from uh, from Peter Roth, who was running Fox at the time was very he had a he had peter roth had these rules these personal creative rules about television and one of his rules was you know in the first couple episodes really get into the the hero's backstory and his family and everything and in a show like this it's like well his it's all about his poor it was a very dark episode it's all about his raped wife and the guy kept, but again i think that's an episode that we wouldn't have done until much later in the in the in the uh, thirteen episodes, if it weren't that Fox was like, "Oh, we want this episode early on. Let's talk about." Well, if you if you remember, Sai, it was written as later in the series. Mm. It was supposed to air after Poem, and it ended up airing like really early, like shockingly early, considering it was a callback episode involving the heroes tragic backstory like Cy was just describing. I think we generated it because the head of the network was really interested and wanted to do that and, and as soon as possible and we kept holding off like oh it should be a later episode and then they aired it like third episode I think anyhow so but it's really it's funny that Fox was always concerned the show was too dark and then of course the third episode they aired was one of the darkest fucking episodes <laughs> oh my god it's all about rape it's all about well, rape. And, and, yeah. and, and not just that, but it's also about the mother oh. who has to, who's trying to protect her son. Now, obviously, her son was a bad guy, but still, she's he was an adult when he went off and committed his crimes. 
she's trying to protect her son, and then the hero basically kills her son in front of her eyes. You know, oh, oh it, my, it was so really dark, and rough. So rough. Yeah, I, love I mean, he was one, already though. dead, but he sends her son back to hell. You know, I know it's oh, it, to heaven. That's yeah, right. True. That's right. That's right. what she says. Yeah. Right, and yeah. stone. Yeah, right. Stone shows some mercy and says, yeah, he's back to heaven. Yeah, yeah well, right. All the souls had different colors sometimes when they were going off to wherever they were going in prison. I noticed uh, blue or slash white because of, of the show color and then orange and then a purple sort of one. Yeah, I, I don't I I remember. There was like a, a reason for that, but I don't, I think, don't we... think there was a reason. I think it was okay. just changing up the effects like, OK, let's do this now. This looks okay. cool. Yeah, or more like the the visual context of the location and the right. scene oh, and sure, what, sure. what would work while you were away. Si, uh Jeff mentioned one of his other favorite episodes is repentance. Oh yeah. Yeah. Which, that is, was, that was which really is a really awesome episode. Yeah. I mean, right away, right. We, as soon as you do even the second episode, we, we got into right away. And this is something that Peter Horton and Ethan, and I a hundred percent agreed on. We didn't want to make the damn soul of the week, just be a straight up, two-dimensional evil bad guy so right away we got into these notions of you know what is evil morality what do people do do they not do and so and and and, ex, and sort of ex, examining why people do terrible things do they deserve to go to hell are at times is uh zeke stone reluctant to do his job because he feels like well maybe this person doesn't really deserve to go back to hell or didn't deserve to go to hell we got into that like right out of the gate. I think I will. I will say that's the thing that I think uh, Ethan and I and Peter really uh, were uh, simpatico on and had a real synchronicity about always that sort of moral gray area and that moral question in every episode. Um, I mean, it, it, the ultimate example of which probably is repentance, because the damn soul from hell and repentance, when he breaks out of hell, all he does is good. All he does is run around trying to help people and protect innocent people because he feels so guilty over the horrible things he did in his lifetime, which forced him to be sent to hell, you know? Now, I want to I want to bring up a question. Did any of you guys, especially I know, Jeff, you watched it from the beginning, the, the, the new viewers. Did you predict the uh, Detective Ash twist or was that uh no i said no. nothing to him about anything. <laughs> <laughs> it was so, great so the thing is the the interesting part of that is that you know when we can it's funny if you go you guys should go back and watch every scene she's in there's some hint that she's from hell you yep. the very first scene she's in she says something. Jeff, about, Jeff is nodding knowingly because he's watched the show yeah. like 10 times. Like every Even last still, I noticed something like now. somebody says, oh, it's like her blow. So he says, there's no, she'll say, there's no such thing as vampires. Like she'll, every scene, she drops a hint, a subtle hint that she's got some, or she knows something about the supernatural or that she's got. And it's funny. But part of the reason I think it worked, and this was an interesting, and I give credit, we had two, um, non-writing producers a husband and wife team that came onto the show after a pilot uh uh uh, uh ian sander and kim moses uh who done a lot of did a lot of series television uh and they were really they had when we were casting that role ethan and i had always conceived of it as ash as being this like sort of dark femme fatale type character and kim and ian had had uh, a relationship they had they had worked with terry polo in something before and we had brought all these actresses in that were much more like i would say femme fatale much more exotic and then they had this idea to bring terry in and terry polo is literally like the girl next door she's like yeah. all american you know squeaky clean blonde and at first ethan were like well this is totally different this is not Ash, this is not Ash or Badaku. And then we realize, like, oh my God, this is perfect because nobody will ever predict that Terry yeah. Polo is this a, pa- a pagan priestess from So I, I credit Kim and Ian for really, you know, bringing Terry to our attention and and, and making that uh, casting idea 
so palatable. We were like, my God. And I, again, it was something where you conceive of something initially, and then through the collaborative process, you come up with something that's much better. I also want to say... For the record, I do believe, and because Brimstone was a show that was so under the radar, and by the time the last episode aired, nobody was watching, nobody cared, I do think we put the first uh, female-on-female kiss on network television, because you notice in the very last episode of the show, the guy, the new boyfriend for Stone's wife, is making out with her, and then the camera turns around, and suddenly it's Ash making out with her. Now, the only reason we got away with it is because nobody cared. It was the last episode. Fox, I don't even think they, I don't even know if they even read the script. They were just, yeah, whatever, this show. Who knows? But I was thinking to myself, my God, they're not going to let us. No, we didn't know. We didn't know it was the last episode. No, no, it's not that. But my point is, it was 13 episodes in the show. The ratings were marginal. I'm just saying that. We, we, didn't, we did not know that the show, they didn't know the show. Was I'm not ready. saying we knew it was the last episode. I'm saying that it was late in the run. The show was not yeah. a big hit. I was shocked that they let us actually, they let it, they didn't ding it in the script. We shot it. We cut it. It was there. They didn't, they, we put it on the air. Yeah. Everybody, everybody talks about like, oh, I think Allie McBeal was the first gay female kiss. It's like, no, no, it was actually Brimstone, but no, <laughs> nobody remembers it and nobody paid attention. But you know, I, I had a, or my wife and I, we had friends who had kids in the same school, about the same age as our kids. And the dad, around this time, the time we did Brimstone, or I, I guess actually a few years later, and the dad had worked in standards and practices at Fox. And the dad actually said to me a few times, like, Boy, you guys really kept me busy. Boy, was, <laughs> we got a lot of stuff. We had a, we were always, we were always having a butt head with you guys. You know? That's funny. Yeah, I do. It's funny. You, I, I will say, uh, because I just because we brought it up, and I'll, 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 I'll we'll go into it. The, the sort of the end of the show, the show actually got picked up for a full season after our thirteen episodes, and we actually were prepping to do another six, eight, nine episodes of the show. And then the regime at Fox changed. And the oh. new president of Fox basically came in and was like, why are we doing this show? This is the ratings are half-assed. It's expensive. Who cares? They were just sort of like, eh. And so literally, I think this is one of the first times in television history that a, a back order, a network full season pickup was rescinded by the network after we had actually been picked up. And the reason well, it was it was the first day of principal photography for it episode 14 for episode 14. Yeah, there is. I, I think, Jeff, didn't you mention that you actually had seen footage or you knew there was footage that there is still footage out there from the YouTube channel 14th episode? Yeah. Yeah, I saw it. Earlier. That footage only exists because Cy kept the negative in his refrigerator. That's, <laughs> that's why that footage exists, literally, because it was a negative shot on Super I had to, yeah. What happened is we literally were Which shooting. Which is insane, but. We were shooting episode 14, and we got the call. The show is canceled. And we said to Warner Brothers, well, we just started shooting episode 14. Can we at least finish episode 14? And they're like, no. no. We're pulling the plug. We're not spending any more money. The show's canceled. It's over with. And Ethan and I and Peter had to like. Well, Peter was already at the set. Was he at the set? I went, you right. and I we went to, to the set. Go to the set and say, yeah. hey, guys, we just got canceled. We're pulling the plug. And everybody was shocked because the show had been picked up for the back order. No, the worst was the most tragic detail was the guest star for that episode. Sort the of like the, what we called the damn soul of the week who was a very talented actress who was playing an IRA assassin, an okay. Irish woman who had been an assassin for the IRA and had, you know, died and been sent to hell for her crimes. And she had killed herself working on a really legit, like Belfast Irish accent, like not just an Irish accent, but like exactly in line with the specific wow. backstory of her character. 
and she got to do it for one day in like two scenes, and then yeah, and then the it was over. It was really sad. Down. Yeah, I it mean, she got they episode. all got paid. The cast got paid, but but yeah, the show got shut down. They never I got have, to see them. So I have to say two things. I'll say about the end of Brimstone. One is the episode. I always say to Ethan, the episode I regret not doing that we were going to do in the back order that we got approved to do. And it's so much that I always feel like, did we shoot this episode? No, we didn't shoot this. There, we were going to do an episode where Stone and the Devil actually team up to track down the damn soul of the week. It was going to be like the buddy cop episode of the show. Because we thought, like, well, Horton and, and, and John Glover are so great together. Let's just give them a whole episode. Where it's the two of them. And we thought it would be so funny... It'd be like 48 like, hours in hell. Exactly. <laughs> and the idea that, like, in this situation, tracking down a damn soul, really, uh, Zeke Stone is, is like, he's the man. He's the point man. And the devil doesn't really know what he's doing because yeah. Stone is the cop and he knows this. And we just thought that would be a really fun episode. That's the one episode that we were going to do in sort of the back order that I really regret that we never got a chance to do. The other thing that I always feel about about the end of the show is the irony is, and this wasn't planned, but the 13th episode was such a great ending to the series. Yeah, yeah. we really, we lucked out to such a great degree, like the TV gods. If you're going to get canceled, which sucks, if you, if you create and run a TV show, we had the best way for that to go. And really looking back, even... Even the rescinding of episode 14 and the tragedy for the actors of being shut down on the first day of principal photography for the history or the legacy of Brimstone to end where it does is is so much better than if it had dribbled on for like another one or two episodes. Because unless we got through to the end of that season or done a bunch of seasons and gotten to the ending of the whole series, which Maybe we can talk about, which is something yeah. that Cy and I had actually worked out in advance, so to speak. Oh, wow. The way it, the way episode 13 ends is just, there's no way to beat it, you know? And it's crazy that we didn't know, we really did not know, even subconsciously, that we were going to end up getting canceled uh, when we made it, you know? Yeah, but it's a dealing with Stone and his wife and, and, and dealing with Ash and all that stuff. It was just... It it's sort of yeah, as Ethan said, we got uh, blessed by the TV gods that because when you watch the series now, it's sort of the perfect ending. You can't really yeah. they can't cursed really us with one hand by canceling us and blessed us with the other hand by letting us end on a, a perfect note. Yeah, most shows these days go 10, 13 episodes at most for a season anyway. Nobody really gets like the full 20, 24, right. 26 yeah, episodes true. True. in one shot unless you're yeah. Star Wars. Right. Well, most shows aren't on old school networks, you know, yeah. that, that still and even there, they don't all go 22 episode seasons. Yeah, it's true. So what did you maybe have in mind with the ending since you brought it up? Special editors note, we had such an incredible interview with Ethan Reef and Cyrus Voris. We're splitting it into two. Sorry for leaving you on a cliffhanger, but our next episode will be out on Halloween. So please be sure to stay tuned to our feeds. It will be out very soon, and you'll not regret it at all. We're also proud to announce an affiliation with FilmLore.no. If you love reviews, interviews, and so much more, please head over to FilmLore.no and discover a whole new world. Make sure you check us out on all of our social media platforms. We got Facebook, Twitter. We are at Suns and Shadows. We're also on Instagram at Suns and Shadows Cast. We are at sunsandshadows.com. Thank you again, everybody, and we'll see you down the road.